All right. Well, thank you for coming, everyone. You're in Fairbanks, Alaska at the Alaska Dog Mushing Association. And today we have uh, presenting Mr. Rob Downey. He's the president and founder of Anime Pet Foods. And today he'll be presenting Feeding the Canine Athlete, Including the Effects of Heat Stress. Thank you, sir. Well, I'm truly honored to be here this afternoon with the Alaska Dog Musters Association. I really want to thank the ADMA board and especially Nora Lee for setting this up. I'd also like to thank Steve Vick for his IT portion, which is really difficult. And it's great to be back around Alaska. Um, to give you some of my background, we competed in sled dog races for over 40 years, everywhere from the Bat Patagonia region at the southern tip of Argentina to the Pyrenees Mountains of Spain. But certainly the most enjoyable part of our career was the 20 years we competed in races in Alaska against the best competition in the world. And we certainly spent many wonderful days at the Mushers Hall running dogs and making lifelong friends. Um, I'm no longer running dogs, but still enjoy dog sports and I'm currently participating in canine dock diving events. And someone asked me, what's the difference between training a sled dog and training a dock diving dog? I said about 80 degrees. So to give you some of my background, um, I was born and raised with dogs. All I've ever wanted to do is work with dogs. And I grew up with short hairs and pointers. And then I went away to college and got involved in sled dog sports. And the first team I had was a ragtag bunch of um, sled dogs that were rescue dogs that had some sort of behavioral physical issues that made them available. And I really enjoyed working with these dogs because with working with many rescue dogs, you just show them a little TLC and it's amazing how they respond. And that's really what got me into nutrition. That dog in the inset, her name was Heidi and she was my lead dog. And uh, one morning when I went out to hook, try and train the team, she couldn't hardly get out of her house and she was sort of dragging her hind in and like it was paralyzed. And of course that freaked me out. I rushed her to the vet and um, they did extensive testing and finally came back and said she was selenium deficient. So I changed her diet and not only did she get much better, but the whole team performed better. And I thought, wow, this is really what I want to do. And it really was my aha moment. And it, I changed my major and started studying nutrition. And I've done that for probably the last uh, 40 years. And interestingly, now I realize that uh, Heidi wasn't selenium deficient at all. It was a whole other, whole other issue. But <clears throat> as for my training in nutrition, I got my undergraduate degree at the Ohio State University and then I spent seven years doing graduate work in canine nutrition at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, my advisor there was Dr. David Kronfeld. So I'm actually a companion animal nutritionist and uh, a lot of my work's been published in several peer reviewed veterinary nutrition journals and is currently cited in the NRC Nutrient Requirements of Dogs and Cats. So as some of you may know, um, dogs were the first animals domesticated by humans. In fact, that began in the Paleolithic era about 15 to 30,000 years ago. And you need to understand that dogs were domesticated by humans before any other plant or animal, including food crops or livestock. And so, <clears throat> unfortunately, we all see the commercials that say your dog is just a modern day wolf and should not and should eat like that and all meat. And well, you also need to remember that a wolf didn't eat every day and they would spend every three to five days searching food. And, um, and so um, now, not only are we feeding dogs every day, we're feeding them multiple times a day. So it's no wonder that obesity is the number one problem facing dogs today. So um, there was recently a study they did in Sweden where they compared the DNA of wolves to dogs of different breeds and the ability to um, break down starches in the amylase, um, in the amylase gene. And so as a species, we evolve over time. One of the ways we do that is with um, duplicating genes, right? And um, because dogs can be bred so frequently and so often, um, 
it, it shows that, um, that the amylase gene is duplicated so many times now that there's seven times the amount of amylase genes in a dog now that there is in a wolf. So um, this idea that dogs can't break down carbohydrates is simply not true. And there's another study that, that compared blood glucose and they found that the blood glucose level in a dog fed high carbohydrates is no different than a dog fed high protein and fat. So um, <clears throat> the bottom line is a dog is much more metabolically flexible than the wolf is and truly evolving, uh, evolving as an omnivore. So what actually goes into your pet food? Well, there's really three basic parts for your dog's food, right? Um, but the most important thing is that you need to remember that dogs don't require ingredients, they require nutrients. So the three things include the processing, obviously is it baked, extruded, raw, canned, frozen? That's the processing. The recipe is actually how it's put together and what ingredients. And then as far as ingredients, are involved, you need to understand that every ingredient comes in at least four different quality levels. So it's really difficult to look at a bag or a package of pet food and determine quality just by reading the ingredients. And to show you, for example, if I took one of my recipes and just went to cheaper ingredients, I could cut between eight and $16 per bag from the formula or from the retail price. So it just shows you how variation uh, can really dictate by quality of ingredients. So two bags that are sitting on the shelf next to each other that look identical on the ingredient list might not feed as well whatsoever. So um, the other thing that's really happening is that one of the things we learned in 2008 with the um, Great Recession is that the pet industry is recession-proof, right? And so venture capital firms and investment firms have found that out and so they're always trying to invest, right? Because that's a quick way to make money because one thing we know is that people are not going to cut quality or cost when it deals with their pets. And so venture capital money comes in and changes things. And one of the things that we noticed or saw, a friend of mine who sells vitamins and minerals to the pet industry, um, when, when a company, he dealt with a company that was privately owned, family owned and operated, and when he went in to bid the vitamins and minerals, um, he'd have to put country of origin, level of purity, um, any uh, preservative in their shelf life, the whole nine yards. Once that company got bought by the venture capital firm, the next time he went in to bid on the same company, there was one line. The only thing they cared about was price. So it's really kind of scary. So as I mentioned, every ingredient comes at least four different quality levels. And one of the ways you can determine that is by ash level. So a good quality meat or fish is low ash and high protein. So it'll be about 69 to 70% protein and only 10 or 11% ash. But on the other hand, poor quality meat or fish are high in ash and low in protein. So the protein level might only be 42 to 45 and the ash level would be 24 to 28%. And what is ash? Ash is really the non-digestible portion of any ingredient tends to be higher in bone, higher in mineral. Same thing when, when a human dies and we get them cremated, what do we get are the ashes? Well, we actually do that with pet foods. We actually incinerate it to find out the non-digestible portion of it. So um, as you can imagine, if you have two products with chicken in them and one is 70% protein and the other product is only using a chicken that's only 42 to 45% protein, you can obviously see where the difference in quality is. The other thing is that ash makes the diet more alkaline, whereas dogs and cats evolved on an acidic diet. And the other thing is when you start to um, become more alkaline, then you can also um, have problems with absorbing some of the amino acids like sulfur containing ones like methionine and taurine. So a poor quality, higher ash meat certain diet has been implicated in the recent DCM scare. The other thing is that alkaline diets are more likely to cause crystals um, that can really affect your animal. So again, it's really difficult to look at the label and determine nutritional quality. The bottom line is there's going to be companies that will go cheap 
no matter what, in uh, like bottom feeders, right? So um, need to take that into consideration. One of the things we've all seen in the last few years is the increase in pet foods. The price has really gone up and um, really we we're facing a perfect storm. And, uh, you know, for example, some states, the price of eggs have tripled and bird flu has certainly raised the uh, chicken costs as well. So um, the other thing that's happened is we've had a three-year drought that's driven up grain prices. And then we have the war in Ukraine and <clears throat> That's really made the grain situation even worse. Supply chain issues have started to create issues as well, <clears throat> simply a supply and demand. And then the rising production costs are due in large part to the increasing energy and labor costs. <coughs> Excuse me. Transportation costs are rising as well because of increased fuel. There's actually less trucks on the road. So <clears throat> it becomes a supply and demand issue. So the average price of pet foods has increased 14% over the last year. So the bottom line is, if your pet food hasn't gone up in the last couple of years, you really ought to think twice about it. Everybody wants more omega-3 fatty acids, and typically you get them from fish oils. But something you need to understand is that fish don't produce omega-3 fatty acids. They actually get it from the microalgae they consume. And so one of the advantages of using marine microalgae over fish oils is that it's totally renewable and it's also very sustainable, right? And when I mean sustainable, for example, if I'm using fish oils in my product, um, after 12 months, you probably lost about 50% of the principal omega-3 fatty acids. But if I'm using marine microalgae, after 12 months, you're still gonna have 99%. So that's an incredible difference. And so the two principal omega-3 fatty acids are EPA and DHA. And so DHA has been shown to help increase brain development in puppies, also been shown to help enhance cognitive function in older dogs, right? And whereas EPA has been shown to help calm the immune system as well as um, it works on skin and coat. So it's something to consider. As far as a working diet for dogs, um, what you're really looking for is on a metabolizable energy basis. You want 30% protein, and this helps move the red blood cells and tolerate stress. You want fat to be 55% on a metabolizable energy basis, and carbs to be 15% also um, for feedability to avoid digestive upsets. So what is metabolizable energy? Metabolizable energy is actually the energy available after the loss from feces, urine, and combustible gases. So it's basically the energy left for your pet to use once all digestion is complete. <coughs> More recently, some work done at Davis on the Iditarod dogs have shown that that number should be actually closer to 30% protein, 45% fat, and 25% carbohydrates. <coughs> when I presented this years ago in Germany, I was actually kind of amazed that a couple of the Iditarod champions that were there also speaking, uh, I was surprised to learn that they were looking for the same breakdown that we were doing, right? So, um, you know, that was part of the early graduate work where we actually did a study where we could increase uh, stamina by 30% by altering protein, fats, and carbohydrates. So it's always amazing to me that people are willing to spend thousands of dollars into purchasing and training their dogs and yet try to be cheap on fueling them. It just doesn't make sense to me. <clears throat> when I'm saying those percentages, um, that's not how you're going to read it on a bag, right? So a diet that's 32 protein, 20% fat listed on the packaging will actually provide 30% protein on a metabolizable energy basis. Even something that's listing 26% protein and 16% fat on the guaranteed analysis. That also provides 30% protein on a metabolizable energy basis. Well, why does that, how does that transpire? Well, <clears throat> you need to understand that one gram of fat has twice the calories in it that a gram of protein does or a gram of carbohydrate. So um, how does that work out in a diet? So <clears throat> one of the things we need to understand is that long-term exercise uh, eventually dogs turn to fat for fuel. 
But this is an aerobic activity. So you need oxygen to burn the fat in the tissues. And so it's protein in the form of red blood cells that carries that oxygen to the tissues to burn, right? And if you don't have enough protein and it's too much fat, a lot of guys like to pour the fat to them. Eventually what happens is you start, your dogs start to suffer from sports anemia where the red blood cell counts go down you, and they look great because you're adding a lot of fat. So the coat still looks great, but they're sour. And, and this was really seen early on in the very early Iditarods where those dogs would get to, I think it was White Mountain, and they basically would just crash and they would have to pull out there. And bottom line is you found that you could probably run on a strictly high fat diet for about 10 days, but then that was pretty much the limit. And that's how long it was taking them to get to White Mountain. So it's kind of interesting at the time. So let's look at reading ingredient lists. If you were faced with two diets, diet A and diet B, and I asked you to pick which one you would you would feed, most people in the room would pick diet B because there's two sources of meat protein, chicken and lamb. And corn, the bad guy, is actually number four in diet B, but it's actually number two in diet A. Because one thing we know is that in ingredient lists are listed in descending order. So the most popular in, or the most uh, the highest amount in, in an ingredient, that's listed first. The one, the ingredient with least amount is listed last. So diet B here looks better. But what you might not know is that if you uh, have ties, you can list them in any order you want. Now look at it. Diet A with one meat source actually has more meat in it than diet B. And corn, the bad guy, in, even though it's second in diet A, is actually a fourth in diet B because these are ties. You can list them any way you want. The other amazing thing is that if I made that diet B, I could put it in a bag and call it chicken and rice. I could put the same food in the bag and call it lamb and rice. So again, reading these ingredient lists are really difficult. And it shows you how pet food companies will play around with ingredient lists to maximize the marketing um, of it, you know. So, you know, you see these companies that list so many different formulas for every different breed. A lot of times they're just playing with the ingredient deck, the list, not really changing the diet. Well, what about fresh versus meal? If I'm, and I'm just picking chicken here, it could be fish, it could be beef, whatever. But fresh chicken, like you'd buy in a grocery store, is about 70% moisture and 30% dry matter. So a typical tractor trailer is about 40,000 pounds. If I have 40,000 pounds of fresh chicken, it's actually only 12,000 pounds of meat and 28,000 pounds of water, right? Chicken meal, on the other hand, is the moisture has been removed. And the term meal is a... Is a as a processing term. So the moisture has been removed. So now it's only 10% moisture and 90% dry matter. So now in that same 40,000 pound truck load, it's actually got 36,000 pounds of meat and only 4,000 pounds of water. That's why some of these diets that promote fresh meats, um, you're probably not as high a protein as it was when it was a meal diet. So let's see how this works in a diet. So now look at diet A and diet B. I'm just looking at animal proteins. Diet A is chicken meal, but diet B has fresh elk, fresh chicken, chicken meal, and fresh salmon. Everybody's going to go for diet B, right? Well, again, it's on descending order, and let's look at it from a dry matter, right? So if I have 1,000 pounds of chicken meal and I remove that 10% of moisture, now I have 900 pounds of dry matter protein. But if I'm using fresh elk, fresh chicken, chicken meal, fresh salmon, it ends up being twice as much going into the process, but coming out, it's still the same 900 pounds of dry matter because you need to understand that listed on the ingredient list is wet weight. So how it goes into the extruder, not how it comes out. So again, this is why uh, companies play with these things and make it look a lot better on the label.
when they're starting to add some fresh meat. Feeding instructions on the bag can really be misleading. And honestly, if I wasn't required by law to put these on the bag, I really wouldn't because every dog is different. These are just basic starting points and you tend to be geared towards a hard keeper. So um, for example, if I have a litter of seven puppies and I raise them to adulthood, one in that litter is gonna need 40% more calories than the average. And one in that litter is gonna need 40% less calories than the average. So you could have two puppies in the same litter. One's going to need twice as much as the other, right? And so oftentimes when a dog stops eating food, it's not because he doesn't like the taste. It's because they don't need it anymore. Because unlike humans, unlike humans, dogs tend to eat to their caloric needs. So most pet food companies have to gear their feeding trials towards a hard keeper, right? Or the feeding uh, instructions towards a hard keeper because then um, an easy keeper will just stop eating. But if you gear it towards the easy keeper, the hard keeper could actually starve and then you're, and then you're um, liable. The real thing I wanted to talk about was salmon oil. I mentioned that, um, that um, the best way to get omega-3s is through marine microalgae, right? Whereas most people want to use um, uh, salmon oil. And um, what you need to understand is that Salmon numbers are dwindling. In fact, I remember uh, being in Alaska one winter and an old Athabascan elder told me that, you know, Rob, before you white men were here, we had all the uh, salmon we could use. Now we have to live by your laws. And now the numbers are so dwindling. So it's always been concerning to me that we're using up all of our natural resources and we need to start preserving them. So salmon numbers are going down. The other thing that's quite amazing is that currently 80% of fish oils produced on this planet go into aquaculture. So they're actually going into aquaculture uh, to feed the fish, right? And the other thing that's kind of interesting that the salmon oil um, that you're getting is actually coming from their heads. Salmon heads are a rich source of the uh, lipids and fatty acids. But again, it, um, part of the reason they tell you to keep it uh, refrigerated is that it oxidizes, right? And so, um, you know, they uh, you start to lose it. So, so <clears throat> one of the things that um, I started to add these, uh, how to compare different nutrient values is that, you know, when you're reading the label, it's those are as fed, right? Um, it says how much protein, fat, but from a nutrition angle, we look at it on a dry matter. And so one of the things is how do you compare different foods? Say you're feeding kibble and you want to add raw meat to it and you have the analysis, but how do you compare those, right? And so what you have to do is that you have to take it from as fed to dry matter. So every... Um, uh, label will show you percentage of protein, fat, fiber, and moisture. And these are listed as as fed. But AFCO requires you to show it in dry matter. So just to show you how this changes, I, I put up a little chart. And so I put a couple of animate products, one of our puppy formulas, one of our seniors, and then I put in two raw diets, and then I put into two can. So in order to compare raw foods to to canned foods, to frozen, to raw, you have to put it in a dry matter. So let's look at how this reads. So if I'm looking at Animate Ohana, on a protein level, on the bag it says 30. If I remove that 10% moisture, actually on a dry matter, which is the true number, it's actually 33%. Now let's look at something like raw. And these were a couple of popular raw diets. Um, look at the fat in raw A. It's li actually listed as 9%. But on a dry matter basis, it's, it's actually 41%. And the same way down with canned. But the really scary part is actually when you get to the calcium, you're only allowed to add 2.5% calcium. And the raw diet's actually listed 0.6 or 0.75% calcium on an as fed. But you remove that moisture, and it's actually over the AFCO uh, maximum allowance. So it's kind of scary. And can people have caught on to this? You can't even find their ash levels or their calcium levels on any of their websites. So <clears throat> how do you calculate this? It's actually pretty simple. All you do 
yeah, to determine the dry matter from as fed is that the prop, the guaranteed analysis has to list moisture. So you just subtract that by 100 and that gives you the dry matter. And so in order to determine the dry matter basis of, an, of a, a nutrient, you take that as an as fed. So say it's, um, look at the, we're looking at example, on an as fed basis, the fats listed as 16. All you do is divide that by the dry matter that you just determined and multiply it by 100. And now that fat comes out to 17.7 on a dry matter. And on a, on a fat in a raw food, it's listed as 9%. And the moisture is 78. So the dry matter would be 22. And so you just divide it by 22. And now it's almost 41% dry matter. So it shows you, if you want to compare kibble to frozen or raw or whatever cans, um, you got to do it on a dry matter basis. How about vitamins? This was a study that shows you how important they are. They followed 2,000 beagles for 15 years, and they randomly assigned them to uh, one of four diets varying in just in vitamin levels. They included low, medium, high, and extra high. How crazy is it after 15 years, they found that the dogs on extra high vitamins lived 23% longer than the dogs on average vitamins. Veterinary visits on when they were on extra high, they had 29% less veterinary visits on uh, extra high than on average vitamin levels. Tumor incidents, it was actually 32% um, lower when they were on extra high vitamins compared to average vitamin. And the scary part is when they went out and did their testing, they found that less than 5% of the foods on the market tested had extra high vitamins. So it, uh, that's really pretty sad. I'm going to change gears a little bit and now talk a little bit about when you're exercising your dog. Um, you need to understand that glycogen is your dog's main energy source, right? And uh, glycogen is a stored um, carbohydrate. And um, it really is uh, glucose. It's another, it's the main energy source. Glycogen is the stored form of glucose. So you need to maintain that. And so that's why you hear a lot of people talking about using post-exercise carbohydrates. So bottom line is when your glycogen is depleted, your dog has a lack of energy and may be listless the next day. And you also need to understand that for the first 40 minutes of exercise, your dog is running on glycogen. And then the fat starts to kick in and they become fat burners. And so Mother Nature is going to replenish glycogen over time. But if you're um, doing events back to back, um, there's not enough time for Mother Nature to do that. So bottom line is post-exercise supplements help rebuild stores of muscle glycogen to pre-exercise levels. And bottom line is they're basically uh, your dog's going to re replenish after 24 hours. Uh, probably the principal one that everybody talks about is maltodextrin. It's the major one used and probably partly because it's a glucose polymer. And so being a glucose polymer, it really reduces the insulin spike that you get by using simple sugars. Betaine and hydrous is another one that's gaining some um, use. It's a natural form of choline and it acts as an osmoregulator in transporting moisture across the cell walls and it's been shown to help maintain a lower body temperature, which is really important. But the bottom line is timing is everything. If you're not going to do this after the first hour post-exercise, you're wasting your time. The other thing is when you're using one of these post-exercise carbohydrates, don't give it with food because you're going to slow it down or make it, uh, it's not going to be very effective. So <clears throat> give it to them within the first hour and wait at least another hour before you feed them. Another thing I think is so important are joint supplements. And this actually started in Australia back in the 50s. And they actually thought chondroitin was going to help people with heart conditions. And so they uh, put people on chondroitin with these heart conditions. And six months later, went back and they tested them. And they found out that 
Um, none of them had better heart or helped their heart conditions, but they're all moving around easier. So it literally was the birth of the of the joint in industry, the joint supplement industry, right? So what we found using a good joint supplement is that we had less injuries during the season and they lasted longer as a top athlete in the end of their career, right? So um, I remember being in a retail store one time and I said to the woman owner, I said, the problem with dogs is by the time you get them perfectly trained, they're usually too old to do what you want. And she looked at me and she said, just like men, which then I didn't know what to say. But the bottom line is you can lengthen their career by putting them on a good joint supplement. There used to be the idea was wait till they get old to do it. Um, well, now studies have shown you don't want to wait that long because, for example, they start to lose the ability to metabolize glucosamine when they get to be about four or five years old. So this idea of waiting until a dog is old to give them a joint supplement is really outdated. And so typically with a sled dog, you're looking at about 1,000 milligrams of glucosamine, about 700 milligrams of green lip muscle or of chondroitin. We also use green lip muscle, which is a natural anti-inflammatory. One of the things we don't really use is MSMs. MSMs are metabolized in the body of a dog, a lot like DMSOs in a horse. I've just not seen any clinical evidence that they work um, in dogs. The other thing you might consider is psyllium, which is a soluble fiber that helps strengthen the gut villi. And so they're less prone to digestive upsets. So a lot of companies are adding the glucosamine and chondroitin to their dry kibbles and does it really have any effect? Well, heat really does have an effect on both. So it's somewhat destroyed in the process of making a kibble. So the idea of putting in enough glucosamine and chondroitin, um, a lot of it's destroyed. And so currently on the market, uh, most dogs are only getting 20 to 50% of the necessary dosing from kibble. So supplementation is still really needed, right? So um, it's something to really consider. And glucosamine and chondroitin are the most common selling points for senior formulas. And currently, 68% of the products on the market are promoting glucosamine and chondroitin. Uh, we really believe in glucosamine and chondroitin, but I don't believe you need to try and put it in your kibble. And why do so many do it? Because this is a copycat industry. Once somebody starts doing something, and uh, somebody will copy them. In fact, this really came to light for me many years ago. There's a, one of the big kibble companies put in a new source of vitamins and they misspelled the name of the vitamin. And within six months, half a dozen other companies listed the same vitamin misspelled and all. So it just shows you how they're copied. So when you're looking at supplements or looking for supplements, you should look for this little eco logo that says NASE. That's the National Animal Supplement Council. It's probably the... Um, gold standard for animal supplements. That means that when, when to be NASC certified, you actually have to be inspected. You have to buy all your raw materials from an NASC certified supplier. And then they actually go out and they purchase your product in uh, retail, and then they send it out to have it tested. And so if you say you have a thousand milligrams of glucosamine, they'll actually test to make sure you do it. If you don't, you got to stop sale. The other thing they do is that they have a scientific conference every year. And um, if you're an NASE, so uh, if you're NASE certified, you have to send somebody there. So it's really kind of um, a great idea. So <clears throat> we're going to change now and do go into some of the heat stress stuff that we did uh, many years ago. So um, I don't need to tell you this, but as you're aware, but Temperatures tend to be warming, and so that's exposing more dogs to heavy exercise in uh, warmer temperatures. And so in running dogs, the increased rate of heat production is about 10 times the heat gain that could occur in the hottest desert on Earth. So it's something to really be aware of. And one advantage is that the dog uh, has is that it's a panning animal and they're very well structured for running in warm temperatures. And that is why so many dogs that have evolved in the desert have longer, narrower snouts. And there's really two main reasons for this. 
Oops. Sorry. The first one is <clears throat> in the nose, there's a complex infolding of bones called turbinate bones. And there's actually more surface area of the turbinate bones than there is in the total uh, surface area of the entire body of the dog. So that's how intricate it is. And then the next one is actually the nasal interior has an organ unique to panning animals. It's called the lateral nasal gland. And this gland secretes fluid onto the mucosa and it provides a constant supply of water for evaporation. And evaporation is really the key as it cools the mucosa very efficiently. And so with each breath, the dog dries, uh, inhales dry air across the moist surface of the mucosa. And then that moisture evaporates and the cooled mucosa uh, cools the blood flowing through it. And then this cooler blood is headed for the brain with the whole point of being this is keeping the brain cooler. So panning increases evaporation from the nose and mouth keeping the brain cooler than other deep body uh, regions. So increased respiratory ventilation as well, right? So one of the things that happens is uh, the breathing pattern changes, right? So at rest, the dog inhales through the nose and exhales through the mouth. But an exercising dog inhales and exhales both through the nose and the mouth. So the respiratory evaporation in exercising dogs is double that of resting panning dogs in hot dry air. So <clears throat> what also happens is it increases blood flow to the tongue, right? And this may be increased about sixfold. So uh, allowing more blood, blood to be cooled to keep the brain cooler. And that's why if you happen to get a dog's tongue nicked while you're running them, it just seems to blood bleed so much. It's just because there's six times the amount of blood going there, right? The other thing I should point out is you really should be careful about feeding your dogs before exercise because it's blood um, that's really helping to cool it, your body, right? So the blood that could go to the uh, extremities to aid in heat dissipation is now headed to the stomach to aid in digestion. So with that food in your dog, he's going to probably run hotter, not to mention that that food flapping against the intestinal wall can cause some bloody stools or diarrhea. So some carnivores, including the dog and, and even some even-toed hoof mammals, have evolved the heat exchanger network to help maintain the brain at a lower temperature than the rest of the dog. This cooling system is called the carotid rate. It actually acts as an intracranial vascular heat exchanger, cooling the arterial blood headed for the brain. So the arterial blood headed for the brain is cooled by the venous blood that drains the nasal and oral passages. So in animals with a carotid rate, it provides help against overheating during the most severe thermal stress of exercise. <clears throat> so bottom line is the carotid rate acts like a radiator in your brain, and it uh, helps almost increase a threefold increase in brain cooling during exercise. You also have in the brain the hypothalamus, which really acts as a thermometer in the brain of the dog. And so what happens when your dog is exercising um, and the body temperature starts to go up, when the dog gets too hot, that thermometer will actually shut down. And then the body temperature skyrockets, right? And the dog overheats. But then when the, when the dog cools down, that thermometer will reset at a much lower temperature. So the dog is much more prone to overheating. So you really want to avoid cooking or frying the dog. And so how do you do that? <clears throat> One of the most important things is simply conditioned, right? A more conditioned dog will be better in the heat. But we also found in our study, bigger dogs tend to run hotter. And as far as genders, studies have shown that female marathoners actually run cooler than their male counterparts. We saw some of that in our work, but I actually thought it was more about size and gender. But here's something that really surprised us. Females in season are much more prone to heat stress. So be really careful running a female that's in season, right? And then 
Also could be affected by feeding schedules. As I mentioned before, if there's a lot of food in the stomach, the dog's good, likely to run hotter because honestly, um, food, the blood that could go to the extremities, they hate aid and heat dissipation. Now it goes to the gut to aid in digestion, right? So, um, and then again, associated with prior overheating, if a dog gets cooked, it's really a problem. Um, so I actually, I actually promote feeding a dog once a day, right? Instead of feeding them in the morning and then running them and have all that food in the stomach. And actually there's a, the dog aging product project has now uh, sent out a study where they found that dogs fed once a day are actually healthier. So, um, you know, that's something to consider too. It's actually called autophagy, which is a natural self-preserving mechanism where the body removes damage or dysfunction parts of the cell. And that happens during uh, when they're not being fed. Heat stress effects on, on reproduction. It actually can decrease male sperm count. It could increase fetal reabsorption. So when you breed a female, you really ought to be careful running it. And I know a lot of people say, well, I'll run them for a few weeks. Honestly, I don't think that's um, a good idea at all because they can reabsorb the fetuses. Also, litter size will be then thus smaller. Decreased birth weight can impair uterine tissue. Something else to remember is that newborn pups have no heat tolerance. So make sure you keep them uh, warm, keep them cool, right? Um, as far as decreasing male sperm count, I actually read a study. How crazy is this? They actually determined that Austrian um, taxi cab drivers, uh, this was done years ago, had decreased male sperm count from the sun coming through the windshield on their um, genitals. How crazy. So, okay, next one. So, <clears throat> of course, the first limiting factor to any exhaustive exercise is water. Make sure you're giving them water. Well, what about electrolytes? Well, you need to remember that dogs don't sweat through their skin. They only sweat from their foot pads and nose. So they lose water by panting rather than sweating. And so the Army did studies where they actually found that if you're going to add electrolytes to dogs, uh, working dogs, you can actually increase diarrhea. So, you know, you can actually cause digestive upsets. So... Um, you know, you don't want to be giving running dogs electrolytes. And I really don't understand. There's so many products on the market that still trying to promote electrolytes for running dogs. So you actually, um, it, obviously, if your dog is sick and a lot of diarrhea, you might need electrolytes to bring them back. But uh, for running dogs, electrolytes are needed. In fact, here's an interesting story. I was actually doing a lecture in Finland uh, several years ago. And I was staying at the house of the veterinarian that was um, hosting it. And so in Finland, a lot of uh, everybody, a lot of people are bilingual. So they, they, could, they would certainly understand what I was saying. And so she was translating. And so when I said, do not give electrolytes to running dogs, all of a sudden a group of people on this side of the room started to holler at a group of people on this side of the room and finish. I didn't know what I said, but I obviously offended some people. Well, it turns out that this veterinarian was selling electrolytes to these retailers over here who were selling them to these dog people over here, right? So you can imagine she had to translate it perfectly because half of them would understand it anyhow. But it really created an uncomfortable situation. I honestly couldn't wait till I got to the airport to go home. So also behavior has effects on temperature regulation. If your dog is calm, guess what? He's going to stay cooler, right? And if he's excited and crazy, the nerves are going to strict blood vessels in the skin, and that's going to raise body temperature. So trying to keep your dogs calm at a starting line, which, as I know, is almost impossible, actually isn't a bad way to go. And then one of the last things I would suggest is that um, you need to carry a thermometer. 
because it's an important tool to have when you're working with dogs, especially in the heat, because what happens is uh, when your dog gets overheated and you start to cool them down, whether you're packing them in some snow or ice or water, his body temperature will start to come down, but you wanna remove uh, any ice or snow or anything when the dog's temperature still is above his normal temperature because it's gonna keep going down. And then you're going to end up with a dog that's hypothermic, which is um, which is not good at all. So you don't want their temperature to go too low. And the other thing that happens is when a dog is really working hard and they're very hot, very hot, the panting can actually stop because the dog's body is trying to conserve CO2, right? And so what happens if you don't have a thermometer, then oftentimes those dogs are diagnosed with hypoglycemia when actually they're in heat stress. So I always suggest to people to carry a thermometer with them. Um, and so how do you acclimate a dog to heat? Well, interval training in a cool environment helps and moderate continuous training as well. And um, they're gonna to acclimate to the heat much better when they're fit. So it could take two to three weeks when they're not fit. It could only take a few days to acclimate when they are. And I'm always amazed that um, how people will train their dogs, but not necessarily condition, right? And um, so regular conditioning strengthens your heart muscle. And this improves the heart's ability to pump blood to the lungs and throughout the body. And as a result, more blood flows to the muscles and oxygen levels in the blood in the blood rise. So it's important to have your dog conditioned. And I, we actually did a study a few years ago with one of the state's biggest um, number one search and rescue teams of dogs. And we did some heat stress. And I was utterly amazed at how well trained they were, but how poorly conditioned they were, right? So they were training them to do all this very intricate stuff, but they didn't bother to condition them. So they just wore out and they got hot. And so your dog really needs to be conditioned to really tolerate heat. And so that's the end of the lecture part. And well, we can now open it up for questions. Thank you so much. Uh, would anyone like to ask a question through the mic? No? Uh, do you have a, oh yeah, go ahead. Um, about the hypothalamus, when they get the heat stroke, is there a way to, for that to, I don't know, fix itself? Or is it just conditioning can make them better? That's a great question. That's a great question. What was found was that it's really a, a damage to the brain and it, it they, they will get slightly better over time, but they're never going to be back to where they were. Cool. Thank you. Anyone else? Hey, thank you. So um, I've heard that if you want to put weight on a dog, you need to feed meat as well as kibble. But you can't get weight on a working dog if you're just feeding kibble potentially. So I'm curious if you could comment on that. And then similarly, why not just feed uh, say a sled dog just straight kibble if if uh if uh the protein that you can get from the dried kibble and everything is potentially no. greater than from the fresh meat thank you that's a great question the bottom line is if you're going to feed raw meat it's much more energy dense right there's much more fat in it so you're certainly going to put weight on better um with a higher fat diet kibbles aren't going to be as high in fat is typically what you get from raw meat. And people ask me, am I anti-raw? I said, I'm not anti-raw. I fed raw before raw was niche, right? I used to have 50 sled dogs. That's all we fed. But one of the things that bothered me was we would do this study where we could increase stamina and everybody had access to this, but you couldn't get a dry food to do it. And it wasn't until I started that I really realized that the big problem is so many of these dry foods out there are so poorly uh, digested, they're run at such high temperatures, right? That you're really, um, the bioavailability, a lot of those nutrients 
aren't very aren't very good. So um, you, you really have to be careful about what draw you're using. And you know, if you have access to good meat, a lot of times that can really help your budget too. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, I've heard a rumor before that if you soak kibble, it can break down some of the nutrients and, um, you know, good stuff in that. Is there any truth to that or is that just kind of made up? Um, if you're going to soak kibble, don't use hot water. If you, if you use hot enough water, you can start to break down nutrients and definitely don't microwave it. It's amazing how many people tell me they microwave their kibble. I, for life of me, don't understand. <clears throat> But um, no, it doesn't necessarily break down. I always, I always soak my kibble because um, two things. You're always trying to get more moisture into them, and that's a great way to get moisture into them. And then also any expansion of the kibble is going to take place outside the gut rather than in the gut. Having said that, I'm not sure I'd soak kibble and let it sit for a day or two, right? That's not good either. Any more questions? Oh. All right. So if I'm trying to do like calculations about how much fat my dogs are getting feeding raw meat, yep. how would I know how much fat is in my beef or like where can I look for those sort of numbers? Yeah, right, right. Well, that's the problem. That's the problem with uh, where you're getting your meat, right? I mean, you could probably... I mean, is it raw? Is it, I mean, is it lean or is it fat? Are you buying it? A grocery store will oftentimes tell you the percentage fat, right? Um, if you're buying, depends on where you're getting it. If you're buying a raw product that's made for dog food, that's got to have the guaranteed analysis on it. But what I'm saying is that slide I showed, and certainly I can send you guys a handout. I know it's almost impossible to figure, to, figure out what I was trying to say. I apologize, but I didn't know how else to make it simpler, but it's really a simple calculation to come up with it. But you have to have the gross numbers to begin with, right? Like canned dog food, dry dog food is going to have guaranteed analysis, but um, you'd have to make an educated guess on the fat of the beef you're using. Yeah, for many people in Alaska, uh, we'll use moose and supplement with that. I had a trapper tell me that they were recommending a two-to-one replacement. So if we were giving one cup of moose meat, that it was replacing two cups of kibble. But I'm not really certain where they came up with their numbers. Yeah, right. I would think that there's got to be... I mean, there's certainly been enough work done on moose that you should have an idea of the protein fat breakdown of, of moose meat, right? Right. And then you can make the calculations that way. But you're definitely going to get more fat. I mean, the bottom line is the principal macronutrients of anything is protein, fats, uh, fiber, carbohydrate, moisture, and so if you're going to go with kibble, it's going to have more carbohydrate, which is going to mean it's probably going to be less protein and fat. If you're going to feed a meat, it's going to have certainly less carbohydrate, certainly more protein and fat. So it's going to be certainly more energy dense because there's twice the amount of calories in a gram of fat as there is in protein or carbohydrate. I do have another question here. It says, when water bowl freezes... In 30 minutes, how do you recommend keeping sled dogs hydrated throughout the winter? Yeah, that's why we always gave give baited water in the morning. And then we would feed them and we fed them moistened. And then we give them some water about two hours after that, because that's when dogs are most thirsty after they eat. And then you could even give them some baited water in towards the evening. What do you recommend using for baiting water? <clears throat> well, we used our own kibble, or we also have a, a dried powder product called Impact that's high protein and high fat. It dissolves, and then they just drink it. 
but you could use, you know, thaw juices maybe or um, whatever you have available. Okay. But you got to make it concentrated enough that they want to drink it, right? But that's really critically important is keeping their moisture levels up. And I, I have another question here. Uh, how long after feeding do you recommend running dogs? Uh, 24 hours? No. I actually, yeah. I, I don't necessarily like feeding them and then running them. Now, I was doing sprints. So if you're doing distance, uh, that might be a different ball game because you're, you're out there so long. You have to feed them out on the trail. <clears throat> but if you could give them at least a couple hours, that's why also doing a powdered supplement and letting them drink that to get calories, it eliminates the dry matter. Because one of the problems with dry matter in the gut is that is the dogs running that dry matter is flapping against the intestinal wall. And that's what often um, creates this bloody diarrhea or loose stools. Okay. You find that they don't necessarily have that when the gut's emptied. In fact, you know what I used to do at races? I would actually, when we would, when we would race on a Saturday, Sunday, I would feed them Friday morning because I was going to race Sunday so they'd have all that time for the gut to clear. And on Saturday, uh, because I couldn't do that, I'd only give them half rations. So they wouldn't have so much food in their gut. We have one more question for you here. Yep. I actually have two more, but um, uh, talking about the supplements, um, would you recommend supplementing with collagen at all in either older dogs or dogs that have been previously injured? Yeah, collagen isn't a bad way to go. I mean, that's not a bad supplement. Again, what I would just caution you is that the quality, you know, is all over the board, right? And the source of it, you know, is it beef collagen or, you know, what source? So, yeah, that's not a bad way to help with joints. I'm, uh, and you guys actually have more access to it than a lot of places. But um, I still like a joint supplement. I think that's critically important. And what would we be looking for uh, for a source, for a good source of that? that is, would it be beef or chicken or et cetera? For tallow? I mean, for collagen? Yeah, for collagen. Like, for example, like we've been using stuff that we just get from Costco, just like pills. But um, I don't, I, I've just been wondering, like, is this helping or should we be using something different or what? I'll be honest. I've not done any work with collagen. So I'm not a, I shouldn't be, I'm not an expert on it. And I've not looked at a nutritional analysis enough. I know that a lot of people use it and like it. But I, I can look into that if you want to send me an email. Okay, I can do that. And then um, my last question is you were talking about vitamin supplements. Mm -hmm. um, using those, like a quality kibble and then using a vitamin supplement in addition to that. And would we be looking at like a multivitamin or anything specific? No, I honestly, I think depending on the kibble, you you know, like for example, with our products, we have extra high in everything. I mean, when we when I when I went over that when I was at that study, I brought that information back and laid it out next to what I do, and we're extra high in everything. The only thing I wasn't as high on as what they do is that. They use uh, more vitamin D, and I wouldn't go that high on vitamin D because if you go too high on vitamin D, you actually increase the blood, uh, the calcium absorption in the blood, and we already have way too much calcium in these diets anyhow. So with our products, you don't have to worry about that. I don't know about other products, you know, but I'm so, just telling you what the research showed that 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 only five percent had extra high. So, like, if we were, say, we're feeding anime and we're also feeding raw meat, so would we want to increase our vitamin supplement to kind of account for half the diet being raw beef or whatever? What we always believed was that if it's equal volumes, up to equal volumes, you don't have to supplement. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Does anyone have any other questions? All right. So what if you have a dog that likes to eat your other dog's feces? <laughs> is it missing? Is it missing something, or does it just enjoy it like ice cream? Yeah, it's sort of like that. And the problem <laughs> is, I will tell you that the other problem is that it be, it's certainly behavioral. If you have one that does it, pretty soon you're going to have a lot of them do it, right? And um, I had a friend that had a kennel, and he rescued a greyhound, and the greyhound would eat feces. And next thing you know, pretty soon his whole sled dog kennel was eating pieces and they've never done it before right so it's really a behavioral thing or boredom now if the dog's real skinny if he's looking for calories but i don't think nutrients um would be the case any other questions all right well it looks like uh we're going to conclude the lecture and Rob, thank you so much for your time. It was absolutely amazing. I think we all learned a lot. And we thank you. I yeah. just want to say thanks yeah. to everybody. I miss being up there. Hopefully we'll get back soon. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much.